Okay, 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 okay. Come on, guys. Oh, really? No one is here today, huh? Extra kindness for those yeah. Whoa. Okay. Um, okay, so we're going to continue what we've been talking about with the signaling. Uh, oops. You already got your exams. If you haven't, you can see me. Um, and so far, we've been talking about the major concepts of signal, signal transduction for relaying messages from outside the cell, usually to the nucleus to affect gene expression, cell function, the different receptors, right, nuclear receptors, which I've been finding myself clarifying um, in recitation. Nuclear receptors are not bound to any membrane, okay? It's deceiving because the word receptor is there, which makes you think that it's a transmembrane protein. But listen to the nuclear part of it more than the receptor part of it. It's actually a soluble protein that's going to be either in the cytoplasm, um, in the cytosol, or the nucleus, and it binds to usually a hormone or something. And there's a conformational change, which exposes a binding site for the DNA, which um, it then goes and binds and, and stimulates gene expression. Um, so just make a little star in your notes. Nuclear receptors are not membrane proteins. They are not on the <coughs> surface of the cell. There is not a huge cascade of signaling. Yes? Is it Kreb? Uh, nuclear receptors? Huh? Kreb? Kreb? No. I don't know. I don't know. It's the uh, transcription factors tend to, so nuclear receptors can be, can function as transcription factors when the conformational change happens. Most transcriptional, most transcription factors are not nuclear receptors. What makes a nuclear receptor is that there's something that diffuses through the plasma membrane and binds to something, changes the conformation, and exposes a binding site. There's a, so it's signaling that's not through a um, plasma membrane bound receptor. Okay? Um, CREB, is that what you're talking about? Yes. Uh, I don't think it's, I don't think it's a nuclear receptor. But I don't know. Let's look it up. Okay. Um, despite how brilliant I seem, right? <laughs> Everyone thinks I'm brilliant? Despite how brilliant I'm, I seem, I do not know all of the proteins and their functions. <laughs> so if you give me domains, had you said, it has a DNA binding domain and a, and a, um, signal, a, you know, a signaling molecule binding domain, I'd say, well, it's likely to be receptive. But. Um, okay, so that's my little spiel on nuclear receptors. GPCRs, that's about the G protein and activating something else and the adenocyclase and the cyclic AMP and all that. That's all GPCRs, right? Um, and then we've been doing enzyme coupled and um, ion channel coupled we're not spending too much time on. Uh, we talked about the concept of domains and molecular switches and we spoke about um, in depth about GPCRs and how they're regulated, right? So everyone remembers how you turn off a GPCR, right? That's important. Um, and we started talking about enzyme-linked or coupled um, receptors and uh, signaling proteins. So today we're going to finish that and go through some examples of pathways and a little bit about crosstalk between pathways. Okay, so this was where we ended. Right, we were talking about RAS. Remember we ended with that very awesome uh, practice problem? Yeah? Um, so we were talking about RAS and how it's activated through recruitment of a RAS GEF to the signaling complex. Right? Remember we talked about this GRUB2 adapter protein, which has a, what kind of domain? SH2 domain and binds to phosphorylated to the plasmic domain of the receptor and recruits the GAF and that's what activates RAS. Now when RAS is um, active, it can uh, transmit a signal to multiple pathways. So remember we talked about the different functions of signaling molecules early on. Some molecules function to spread the signal out to different pathways and so RAS would, would fall into that category. Um, 
And so we went, this slide is from last week, but I just kind of wanted to bring you guys back to what we're talking about. So we spoke about regulation of RAS activity, right? How is RAS activity regulated? How is it regulated? What determines if it's on or off? That's what I mean by regulated. GTP or GDP? Okay, so more than that, what, put, what determines whether or not GTP is bound? Whether there's a get where that whether RASGEF is recruited, which all depends on what? Right. So you need the signal that you need the binding and the cross phosphorylation to recruit the adapter protein to recruit the GEF. So no GEF recruited, no RAS activated, signaling not spread, right? And we talked about um, what happens if RAS is always active, right? So for whatever reason, RAS has a mutation where it cannot hydrolyze the GTP and it's always on. That is um, frequently involved with development of cancer. And that was what the practice problem was about. Um, so, so, and then that goes back to just bringing the whole thing together and understanding it's this signaling molecule that turns the whole thing on. This doesn't bind. This doesn't happen. This isn't recruited. And then RAS isn't activated. Okay? So there's the RAS signaling. Do you think it's complicated? Do you think it's simple? Who thinks it's simple? Okay, well, um, it's, yeah, it's complicated because look how many receptors you have here. You've got a GPCR up here. You've got, you've got so many, you've got, um, do you have any ion channels up there? You've got so many different receptors. Why are there so many receptors involved with RAS? Okay, well, let's try this. What is RAS's function in signaling? It activates signaling pathways. It activates a multiple signaling pathways. So that's why you have a whole lot of signaling pathways up here with RAS all over the place. So I just want you guys to understand RAS activates many signaling pathways, which is why when it's mutated and it's stuck in the on confirmation, it's not good, <laughs> right? Because you're activating many signaling pathways, such as pathways involved with cell proliferation, right? Cell growth, cell survival, right? So inhibition of apoptosis, differentiation, cell cycle control, right? Pushing a cell into S phase or mitosis. Uh, cell motility. Can anyone think about what motility has to do with um, cancer? Metastasis. Right, metastasis, exactly, exactly. Um, tumor genesis, that's the outcome, right? So um, RAS is frequently mutated in cancer and um, and it's usually mutated in such a way that it's stuck in the active way, in the active confirmation. Okay, so I keep talking about RAS. Okay, so what's next? So now we're kind of making our way down a signaling pathway, right? So we did a whole bunch of receptors, and then we did um, we did a whole bunch of receptors, and then we did um, some molecules that are kind of involved in activating signaling, right? Kinases. And so now we're going to move our way down the pathway. Because remember, we're at the plasma membrane. We need to get to the nucleus, right? How? And I keep saying it's this, this bucket brigade of phosphorylation. It basically is, right? So that's not what I want to do. There we go. So there's your active RAS, right? And so it activates a MAP kinase kinase, which then activates a MAP kinase which then activate MAP kinase kinase, kinase kinase kinase. They, they were not creative at all, by the way, <laughs> right? Because you've got your MAP kinase, but then your MAP kinase kinase, because it phosphorylates your MAP kinase. And you've got your MAP kinase kinase kinase, which phosphorylates your MAP kinase kinase. Anyways, <laughs> what, do you, what is it really? So you can either try to memorize this, or you can just understand that you've got these kinases, and they are MAP kinases, that phosphorylate and activate each other and move down the pathway, right? So 
It's continuing to relay the signal downstream by phosphorylating gene regulatory proteins and activating other kinases. So you're moving towards the nucleus, right? Because then you end up phosphorylating this MAP kinase is then going to phosphorylate different gene regulatory proteins. So things that are going to go into the nucleus, bind to DNA, and activate transcription of certain genes, right? And then also, um, it will also phosphorylate other <laughs> proteins that are in the cytosol, which will relay signals elsewhere. Any questions? Yes? What's the point of the kinase, 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 and the kinase, kinase? It's just relaying signals. Yeah. Um, because, right, so the MAP kinase, kinase activates the MAP. The MAP kinase, kinase cubed um, activates the kinase squared, which then activates the kinase, and that one is what will then activate other proteins. So it's almost like saying, well, what's the point of all these kinases, right? What's the point of all the kinases? Well, certain proteins act with other proteins, and all these different subunits that have to come together are a level of regulation, right? Because if at some point something's turned off, you're not going to get signaling. And there's so much, you're not just having, like, I simplify things, and I say signaling is receptor, and then signal to the nucleus gene expression. That's really simple, right? But really, it looks a lot more like that, right? So you've got so many things happening that you need these complexes to form and activate things and to, in order to send it in the right direction. Does that make sense? Yep. Okay, any other questions? And why does it need to be so complicated? It's not really. Um, so, MAP kinases are involved in a lot of signaling path pathways because they're not at the top where they're associated with a receptor that's going to go in different ways, but they're actually in the middle where they can, they can also be used by a lot of different signaling pathways. But you have to wonder what keeps them all together because they're all going to activate each other, and so they're kept together by these scaffold proteins. So there's another protein that will bind all three of them and keep them together so they activate each other and not MAP kinases involved in another pathway, right? Does that make sense? Um, so this example is like you can have you can have this mating factor response and you can have glycerol synthesis, two completely different processes regulated by different receptors, completely different pathways. They both use these MAP kinases. But the difference is that you have different scaffolds holding them together and directing them to phosphorylate the correct um, targets and activate the correct pathways. Questions? Nope. So there's your MAP kinase signaling pathway. And you can see one, two, three. Here are three situations where you have your MAP kinases. Is that it? And the other thing you should keep in mind is MAPK is a very general, um, I guess, family name, but you can have them be many different names. So that's MEK is still MAP kinase, but don't worry about that. This is the whole path. This is all, these are all the pathways. Notice lots of receptors, lots of activation of things, and then you've got these different kinases that are relaying signals down. And so they're working in the middle of the pathway. How are we doing? Everyone happy? Are you guys excited for next week's test? I'm excited. Because I'm going to make sure I don't have to grade as many essays. That was really rough. I'm sorry, guys. And I've been like, I've been, I couldn't even pee yesterday because I had so many people coming to see me in my office. Like, at the end of the day, I know, it's probably not professional for me to talk about having to pee. But, like, you know when you're working, have you ever worked, like, at a coffee shop and you're, like, so busy helping customers and then you're like, wow, I've had to pee for three hours. Well, that was yesterday. So, um, everyone's, like, all, like, freaking out. And I understand because grades are really important. But I think I'm going to try to make things a little more straightforward for the next one. Okay, let's talk about something else. So, another, another protein that helps to relay signals is um, 
PI3 kinase. And it's, um, it's, a pla it's, it's plasma membrane bound, and it phosphorylates inositol phospholipids. Where are phospholipids? Okay, good. In the plasma membrane. So here's your um, phosphatidyl inositol, and your PI3 kinase is going to phosphorylate it. And it can be phosphorylated again and again and have a lot of different a lot of different phosphorylations and that the whole point of that is you're creating docking sites binding sites for different signaling proteins um, and PI3 kinase is involved in cell growth and survival which means it might have something to do with cancer if it's dysregulated anything that's involved in cell growth and survival um, often you can find mutations in genes uh, involved in those pathways in different cancers. So let's look at a big picture. What am I talking about? So here's a PI3 kinase uh, pathway. So you'll have some kind of receptor tyrosine kinase, right? You'll have a survival signal that will come. So some signaling molecule will bind to the receptor and it will phosphorylate, each of they'll bind, they'll dimerize and cross-phosphorylate and recruit the activated, um, the PI3 kinase, which activates it, which then starts to phosphorylate these um, phosphatidyl, phosphatidyl, this inositol phosphates, right? And then you have uh, recruitment of other proteins. So here you have your phosphorylated lipid, right, phospholipid. And then you have this docking site for these other proteins. And then you'll get uh, further phosphorylation and activation. But um, So AKT right here, that's a big one that's often mutated in cancer. PDK1, I'm sure, is too, but AKT is huge. You put an AKT most into PubMed, most of the papers that will come up will be cancer-related. So you're recruiting these other kinases and then they're going to activate other things. And then there's this mTOR that's coming along, and it, it is also activating. And then the AKT is going to dissociate from the plasma membrane and go, and it's going to activate, it's going to phosphorylate BAD. And BAD is an inhibitor. And what is this? This is an apoptosis inhibitory protein. <laughs> so if you inhibit apoptosis, do you die? No. So the whole point of this is there's all this phosphorylation and binding and recruitment and phosphorylation and binding and recruitment, and it ends up with phosphorylation and removal of an inhibitor, of an apoptosis inhibitor. Yes? I know you're all about big pictures, so how comfortable do you want us to be with all these? I want you to know every single... Well, um, I mean, obviously not, it's just that I feel like most of what we've been taught is 300 different pathways, and I get the big picture on everything, but I feel like... So all you know, of you've these. So many, we're going to be expected to know something about them. I just don't know how specific you want to stand. It would be funny if students started getting keys to come in. Are you replacing labels? You rang. I called you. You rang. I called for a light bulb replacement. Okay. Well. Oh. This I is guess. so funny. <laughs> Spotlights are driving you crazy, right? It's not me. I didn't call anyone. No. No? Well, we can come back. Well, I don't want to interrupt the class. <laughs> no, they said it was driving you nuts and that uh, we were told to do it. Yeah. Come right up and do it. That's so. That must have been a joke. Who did that? <laughs> so we'll just come back later. That's it. Unless you want to learn about the PI3 tiny. I really do, but uh, <laughs> I've already been through this. So. <laughs> yeah, come back later. It was it totally wasn't me. Okay. All right. What kind of place are we? Um, well, if there's another one and another one and another. I mean, probably by one, maybe. Okay. Check on the door. The schedule's right on the door. All right. Thank you. Yep. I was like, who has a key? <laughs> I don't, I'm coming back to your question. Uh, that was really funny. <laughs> Those guys are awesome. Okay. Um, so all, there's a point to all of these pathways because they're all actually an example of something. Okay. So like 
I'll put in the example of the different types of receptors. So you should understand how a GPCR works versus a nuclear receptor versus a um, kinase-associated receptor versus, you know what I'm saying. Big picture, they're all the same, right? They're all the same. Well, not they're all the same, but within the category. So I might give you a few examples within a category, but what you need to do is be able to compare across the differences. Like nuclear receptor, totally different. You can look at any nuclear receptor, and it's totally different from uh, RTK pathway, right? So that's what I went, so I think that's an awesome question because probably everyone else is sitting here thinking the same thing. And so I think when you sit down to study, ask yourself, instead of going, this points to this points to this, I will never say to you, what does the activated PI3 kinase do? I will never say that because what's the point? There's no point. But I might say to you, um, um, you know, you have a mutation in something that in something that prevents activation of your G protein. Really broad, right? Because your GPCRs all involve G proteins. Or I might say, you have a mutation that is involved with your kinase domain of your receptor, right? Because those all are the same. Okay? RAS, I, I bring up because it's really important in spreading the signal. So I have an example, but if you understand the main function is to spread that signal and to understand that it's activated through, um, it's, a G pro it's, a, it's a G protein basically, right? It's a GTP binding protein and how it's activated and what happens when it's stuck on. That's not a detail. That's pretty broad because it affects a million different pathways. Does that make sense? Yeah. Does that help everyone? Does everyone feel like, oh, I totally understand how to study now? Yeah, okay. Um, so the point of this is it's just another example of signaling, and it's just through a different mechanism. So sometimes you'll have your receptor, and it will shoot straight down. Sometimes it will kind of like go along the membrane for a while, because there are all these membrane-bound things or proteins that are involved, and then it will start moving its way down. But either way, it's all kind of the same, okay? And usually what you end up with, <coughs> you always have some kinase, that somehow phosphorylates something that removes an inhibitor or activates something or prevents degradation of something or induces dimerization. Those things, those things are really good to focus on, right? How, like what regulates whether something's gonna go into the nucleus and activate gene expression, right? And you could think beta catenin, NF kappa B, JAK stat, we're gonna do SMAD in a minute, this one. These are all actually different mechanisms of activation. And I won't say, what does Jack Stat do? But I might say something like introductory thing about Jack Stat and say, so what is the difference between this pathway and this pathway in terms of going into the nucleus? Okay? So is this an example of an RTK? Yep, this is an example of an RTK. Yep, yep. So the PI3 kinase pathway is... Um, often used in relaying the signal from an RTK to the nucleus in some way. Yep. Okay. So, um, so this TOR protein is very important in this process um, because it's involved in activation and um, it's actually, it's, there's a drug called rapamycin that could inhibit TOR and rapamycin is a bacterial toxin <coughs> That's how, and it, that's where it came from, and it's used for a drug for immunosuppression and cancer. So if you think about it, if it's involved in activating a pathway, and I'm telling you it inhibits, um, if mTOR is involved in activating a pathway, and I'm telling you rapamycin inhibits it, it makes sense, right? Because it's involved in for immunosuppression, right? So if you turn off a pathway involved with immu uh, the immune response, you're going to suppress the immune response, right? or um, and cancer. So for example, this pathway is very much involved with cancer because whenever you have cell survival when you shouldn't, that promotes cancer, right? And so if you inhibit a pathway that's involved in cell survival, then that would be chemotherapeutic. Yes? So is, is that generally bound to be apoptosis? Yep, that's how it stays so off. It exactly. Exactly. So bad is normally bound to the 
apoptosis inhibitory protein and active AKT, right? AKT was activated through all the signaling. It will phosphorylate bad and allow the apoptosis inhibitory protein to go on and inhibit apoptosis. Okay? Um, so which genes here do you think might be mutated in cancer? Like if you are studying some kind of cancer and you notice that an apoptosis inhibitory protein is expressed at very high levels. What genes in this pathway, I kind of told you a little bit, might be mutated? AKT, right? AKT is a big one, PI3 kinase, mTOR, pretty much most of them, right? This is a big pathway for cancer. Okay, let's keep going. Okay, so you can also have crosstalk between pathways. So here you have a GPCR, and here you have a RTK. And you can have, through signaling, different pathways that are activated, right? You'll have your G protein, the dinocyclase, the GLP, PKA, that can activate. But you could also have your G protein activate phospholipase C, which then could go in this direction and activate the same thing that your RTK is activating. So it's not like it's straight down, like I drew on the board here. It's actually, you know, there could be something that goes and merges with this pathway, something goes and merges with this pathway, and that's why these signaling um, pictures are so insane looking. Just acknowledge that and appreciate that, the complexity of cell biology. You don't need to memorize this. Please don't. Okay. So we're talking about RTKs a bit. Those are the receptor-tizing kinases that have the kinase domain in the receptor. Um, then there are also these tyrosine kinase-associated receptors. So they actually just have a tyrosine kinase that is bound to the receptor. Um, and uh, they react with and they signal through cytoplasmic tyrosine kinase, right? And they're usually members of the SARC family of tyrosine kinases. And it's a family because it shares domains, right? So there's a bunch of different proteins that are a member of this family, and they all contain SH2 and SH3 domains and bind to cytoplasmic domains of receptors. So um, um, TYK2 and JAK1, those are members of the SARC family of tyrosine kinases. And so you can make the assumption that they have SH2 and SH3 domains, so they probably bind to phosphotyrosines. And um, SH3 domains bind to proline-rich sequences. So that's, there you'll remember that. It's written down. You don't have to scribble down. So SH3 is, is a protein-protein interaction rather than a modified protein interaction. Okay, so um, the JAK-STAT pathway, which I showed you on the first day that we did this. We'll come back to it right now. It's a, an example of signaling through a tyrosine kinase-associated receptor, okay? Right, so you've got your, your receptor, and there's your tyrosine kinase. So it has no intrinsic kinase activity. It's bound to kinases. And when you have um, dimerization because a ligand has bound, then you get cross-phosphorylation. It looks like the same thing. It's just there's another protein there that has the kinase activity, right? And so, again, then you're creating docking sites, right? So you have more phosphorylation. You're creating docking site, sites for your stat proteins, which are then phosphorylated. Then they dimerize, they go to the nucleus, right? We did this before. It's a review, but I'm just trying to point out where it fits in. So in this situation, how is signaling turned off? Right? So you started signaling because interferon is a response to... Um, a virus usually, right? Um, but when uh, the virus is gone, do you want that signaling on? No. So you need to turn it off. So we talked about endocytosis as a big way of turning off signaling, right? Because you're endocytosing your receptor. But what's another way to turn off your signaling? Hmm? Buying something else. So if you can recruit some inhibitory protein, that's a logical response. Yep. Not what I'm looking for, but very, very good. What else? Yep. Prevent kinases from binding to receptor. 
Um, actually, so these kinases here are pretty tightly bound. So that's not going to happen. But think of something that's reversible. Yes? Oh, um, I was going to say maybe another signal would interact with it. Having another, another sig signal, like, like you said, how it kind of like crosses inwards. So bring in another signaling molecule. Yeah, so, so, okay. You guys are thinking too deeply. Yes? Right. Phosphatases. The whole point of phosphorylation is it's a quick response. Add a phosphate group, remove a phosphate group. That's how you regulate your activity. Why start bringing in more, you know, like and changing gene expression, all those kinds of things, when all you can, all you really have to do is re remove a phosphatase. I mean, remove a, a phosphate group with a phosphatase. Right. But all these other, all these other, um, Ideas are logical and, and often work, right? Because we talked about inhibiting, inhibiting GPCRs through recruitment of inhibitory proteins, right? So you're not wrong and you're thinking very logically, but I was looking for phosphatase in that situation. So there's your phosphatase slide. Um, so it's a tyrosine phosphatase, obviously, because you're removing the phosphate group from a tyrosine. Um, and so that's how you modify or can turn off signals. Tyrosine phosphatases, they can be cytoplasmic or plasma membrane bound. This is what they look like. Here's a plasma. These two are plasma membrane bound. Don't ask me why. Even in the book it says um, it's not known why they look like receptors. Um, but the key <coughs> is that you've got, um, well, you have SH2 domains. That's helpful, right? Um, and then you have these tyrosine phosphatase domains, right? So, how would a phosphatase modify a signal, right? You have signaling. What would, what would the phosphatase do to the signaling pathway? Sometimes I ask really simple questions because I'm trying to make sure everyone's awake. It will remove the phosphate, which was, does what to the pathway? Stops it, which does what to gene expression? Stops it, right, right. So, can you still have... Can you still have a res um, something binding to the receptor? Why not, right? Because that's outside the cell, right? A signaling molecule, right? But as long as you have an active phosphatase that's taking those phosphate groups off, you're not gonna, you're not gonna be signaling. Um, okay. So let's talk about more signaling. These are just examples. So we talked about receptor tyrosine kinases. So these are kinases or, um kinase-associated receptors that, that phosphorylate on tyrosines. You can also phosphorylate, for, ugh, phosphorylate serine, serines or threonines. Just something to appreciate. It's not only tyrosines that get phosphorylated. And so then you should think, oh, well, there must be receptors with kinase domains that phosphorylate serines or threonines. And there are. And so um, TGF-beta is another signaling pathway that's involved in development, tissue repair, and immune regulation. Um, and it's um, the, the receptor, the TGF-beta receptor, it has, a, it has intrinsic serine threonine kinase activities. So it's not binding to a kinase. It has the activity within its cytoplasmic tail. And the way it works is you've got ligand binding, and then you've got these SMADs that come along. So you create your, what you're doing is you are, um, uh, so you've got SMAD that's just sitting there in one conformation. And then what it does is it recruits and phosphorylates SMAD, which changes the conformation. And then this other SMAD that's just hanging out in the cytosol can then bind to it. So then you have this, con remember, this, this should make, be, make, be making you think of Jack Stat in a way, because you're having this change in conformation and this binding um, that then it allows it to go into the nucleus. So SMAD4, which is the brown one, is an example of a latent gene regulatory protein. I guess you can say both SMADs are examples of latent gene regulatory proteins. So what, what does that mean to you? What does latent gene regulatory protein mean to you? Just the words. Does that have anything to do with the virus? No. Yes? Um, they have to be acted upon before they regulate the gene? Right. 
Right, so they have to be acted upon before they can regulate a gene. So they're latent normally. So in some way, either they're not phosphorylated or they're folded in a way or something like that. And when something happens to them, either phosphorylation or um, binding or something, something happens that allows it to go into the nucleus. So activation of a latent gene regulatory protein, what do you think it does? Like, what do you think it does to allow it to go activate gene expression? There's a conformational change, but what do you think that conformation that conformational change is exposing? I hear people saying it. Huh? NLS. NLS, right? It's all about whether or not a transcription factor can get into a nucleus or not. I know there's a lot of pathways and it seems very overwhelming, but the theme here is transcription factor entering nucleus, right? That's in every single pathway, and it usually has to do with some sort of change in conformation or some kind of activation. So here you've got these latent gene regulatory proteins. They're just hanging out, hanging out in the cytosol, doing nothing. And then when you have activation, because you've got your receptor binding, which activates a kinase, which then phosphorylates and changes the conformation, allowing them to dimerize and go into the nucleus, that's, that's how you have activation of the pathway. How are we doing? Are you guys excited? Is anyone seeing themes here or are people feeling like I'm just throwing random information at you? Okay, someone said they're seeing themes. Who feels like it's a bunch of random information and they have no idea how they're going to study? Please raise your hand because I'll take a moment. Thank you. Okay. Okay, so I want you guys to, when you start, I want you guys to work on categorizing things and looking for themes, okay? Differences, differences, differences in receptors, differences in ways of activating things, differences in how things get into the nucleus. Look at those themes, and that will really help you. Because, yeah, everything is a receptor and a bunch of phosphorylation and then something into the nucleus. It's actually fairly simple. There are just many ways. I had this this advisor at one point in my life for a rotation I did in grad school. And he was always like, there's, there's, you know, many ways to skin a cat. And that's like the grossest saying ever. But I guess, like, I guess it applies to There's many ways to induce gene expression. Why skinning a cat? Like, why do people even think about skinning cats? Isn't that weird? I guess at some point in time that was a common thing people did. Someone look up the origin of that. <laughs> It's not extra credit. Okay, so let's do a quick practice problem, okay? So I just talked about SMADs. Um, so phosphorylation of... Oh, crap. I kind of told you the answer. Well, let's see if anyone can retain anything. Okay, phosphorylation of SMAD induces interaction with SMAD4 and translocation to the nucleus. What assumption can you make about SMAD2, 3, and 4 in terms of nuclear localization? Take a moment to think or chat, and then tell me what you think. So think of it in terms of what do SMAD 3 and 4 look like before they're phosphorylated and binding to each other, and what do they look like afterwards, and how is this related to nuclear localization? <laughs> <laughs> You're left by yourself today. Yeah. Usually, <laughs> Dylan. No, who sits here? That's usually empty. Heather. Oh, wait, she, she, she came in and then left. Yeah. Okay. Okay, guys, so, so what'd you come up with? No, we're short on time, so I'm going to push you. What'd you come up with? I did just tell you, so you get brownie points for repeating back what I just said. Yes. Right, so binding creates a conformational change, which allows for exposure of an NLS, so it can go into the nucleus. So where do you think the NLS is before they are activated and bind each other? Hidden in some way, right? Okay, good. Um, okay, so then there are these signaling pathways that depend on, of, I thought I fixed that, regulated degradation or proteolysis to, to control the activity 
of these latent gene regulatory proteins. So that sounds like a whole mouthful, but you know this already because we did beta catenin and went signaling. Okay, so this that pathway is beyond fair game for um, for the exam since you guys went over it in detail. You drew it and everything. Um, and I'm not saying what binds to what binds to what, but if I ask how GSK3 is turned off, totally, totally um, fair game. Anyways, so right, so you can degrade things and that will activate things. That's the whole point of this, right? So with Wnt, right, remember Wnt, what's normally degraded, beta catenin, and signaling activates basically the stabilization of beta catenin, so it can go into the nucleus. Um, notch. Well, we'll go through them right now. But notch is involved in development, sulfate, pattern formation, in development of tissues, winter's development, and of kappa B, stress response, inflammatory, and immune. Um, so I do want you to go through these different um, mechanisms of latent regulatory, uh, latent gene regulatory um, proteins, just to kind of understand those differences, because there are differences. All right, so you've got notch. The way notch works is actually it doesn't bind some soluble ligand, but it actually communicates with another cell. So you can see it as um, you've got one cell which is containing um, a protein that's called delta, and you've got another one that's called uh, notch, which is your receptor, right? And so it's involved in promoting a developmental program among groups of neighboring cells. When do you want neighboring cells to develop in the same way? Tissue. I'm hearing why people go tissue, tissue. Right. Kidneys. Do you want all the neighboring cells to be kidney cells or do you want some to be, you know, skin cells? Right? Right? Do you ever wonder why all those cells are together or are the same kinds of cells? So this is involved with that regulation. Um, Okay, so this depends on the regulated cleavage of the, the notch receptor, okay? So you've got your receptor, and so remember, this is, in the, this is the Golgi membrane. Why would this receptor be in the Golgi? Oh, Lord, what is she talking about? Why would a receptor be in the Golgi? <clears throat> okay, I'm hearing it hasn't gotten to the membrane yet has to go somewhere, okay? So everyone who took the exam the other week should be thinking, well, receptors go through the circulatory pathway. Remember, we are not learning these things by themselves. They're all together, um, right? So you have transcription, translation, goes into the ER, goes to the Golgi. Remember, you have some maturation sometimes that happens in the Golgi, and so this is an, is an example where you actually have a cleavage step in the lumen of the Golgi, which results in the... Um, this coming a um, like a dimer, a heterodimer, and so now it's uh, there's this membrane bound, membrane bound, transmembrane domain part with the cytoplasmic domain, and it's just bound to this other part. So this is cleaved right here at number one, and it binds to each other. Why does it do that? So what ends up happening is it will bind to delta, which is on the other cell, the neighboring cell, <laughs> and that will result in a few things. One is it results in endocytosis of that part, but the other thing is it also exposes this cleavage site that's over here. So then that gets cleaved, but then exposes a cleavage site here, and that gets cleaved. Whatever, cleavage, 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 and then you have this um, tail that migrates to the nucleus and binds to something else and activates gene expression. Theme, theme. Cleavage of something, something goes somewhere, right? Activates gene expression in the nucleus. Do you ever activate gene expression outside of the nucleus? No. Okay. Um, right, so it travels in the nucleus to bind to a DNA binding protein, switching a transcriptional repressor into a transcriptional activator. Um, who cares? Activates gene expression. Okay. Here's when to beta catenin. I'm not going through it because it would have been like the millionth time. <coughs> Um, and then here is, um, I'm really proud to say I was involved in the creation of this figure in my prior job. Um, but this is um, sequestration of one signaling right there, of GSK3. Right, do you like, do you like the multivesicular endosome? 
I was working with a graphic designer. I was like, maintain the topology. And he is like an architect, like who like stopped being an architect to become a graphic designer at a biotech company. And he was like, what? Like zero biology background. Anyways. Okay, and so here's NF kappa B, and this is, I think this is it. Um, so this depends on regulated degradation of I kappa B, right? So you've got, again, a, a ligand binding to a receptor, which activates a kinase. Are we seeing a trend, a pattern? Activates a kinase, which then ends up phosphorylating I kappa B, which is an inhibitor. I kappa B is a recognized by ubiquitin ligase, ubiquinated, degraded. And that results in exposure of an NLS, right, in NF kappa B that can then go on into the um, nucleus and activate gene expression. Again, the theme of can the transcription factor get into the nucleus or not? And we talked about before when we are learning nuclear import about this pathway, right? Does everyone remember I kappa B? is binding to NF kappa B and obscuring what? The NLS, right? So here we go again in signaling. Okay, so here's a wrap up of what we've learned so far, right? So we've talked about GPCRs, they signal through G proteins, they regulate signaling through affecting levels of these small intracellular mediators such as sickle gain P and calcium. RTKs, they have this intrinsic kinase activity. They activate other kinases through phosphorylation to relay the signal to the nucleus. Um, Kinase-associated receptors are similar to RTKs, but it just has to do with where the um, kinase activity is. It actually binds to a kinase with the Sark family. And then there's the signaling to regulated proteolysis, which is kind of an extension of the RTK stuff where you're kind of um, liberating a transcription factor in a way, so it can go into the nucleus. And so Friday we'll talk about more things. Okay.